Good morning, everyone. Welcome to B-Side San Francisco. In this next presentation, we have uh, Tom Alcock acting as moderator for the CISO panel discussion. Uh, so without further ado, uh, take it away, Tom. Thank you. Uh, for many of the hiring managers in my network, hiring and retaining security talent is by far one of the most challenging parts of their day job. On top of this niche skill set, we find ourselves in one of the most competitive markets we've seen in many years. And twinned with the great resignation and mass layoffs more recently, it's becoming more and increasingly challenging to hire and retain top talent. I'm Tom Alcock and I'm one of the partners at Code Red and we exist to bridge the cybersecurity talent gap. I spent the last 12 years of my career helping companies to build technical teams and the last four years uh, working on security hires uh, with a lot of these companies at the table today. We've got an incredible panel um, today of seasoned security executives and leaders that I'll introduce in a second. Um, and we're going to explore hiring and culture and how to kind of hire and retain talent. Uh, before we get going, is there any hiring managers in the room? Anyone that's hired in the last six or 12 months? Yeah, keep your hands up if you find it relatively easy to hire during this period. <laughs> There's no hands up in the room. <laughs> Oh, OK, you found it easy over there. Nice, we'll come back to you. We'll make sure we'll come back to you. <laughs> yeah, because they think I'm an expert and I'm not. Yeah, so we need to go, go get here and replace us. <laughs> well, um, these, these folks around me who I'll introduce in a second uh, may have not completed it, but they've done a pretty incredible job of hiring, retaining, and scaling security teams. Today, we'll be exploring how these folks have approached it and, and approached talent attraction in general. And they'll be sharing some of the wins challenges uh, that they face when building teams. So without further ado, I would like to welcome to the table Jessica, Caleb, and Furman. If you'd like to kind of start with you on the end, Furman, introduce yourself, where you're at right now, give it a little, little intro to yourself, and then sure. we'll kick off with some exciting questions. Of course. Uh, Furman Serna, I currently serve as CSO for a company called Databricks. I've been in the job for the last six months, no, 10 months. I feel like I replaced Caleb at Databricks. So um, before that, I was a CISO for Citrix for a couple of years. And before that, uh, I was at Google for almost eight years. Uh, and in my last years, I was uh, head of product security at Google. Uh, very, very excited to be here. Thank you, Tom, for invi the invitation. And you know, very, very excited to be part of this panel. Thank you. Um, Caleb Saima. I'm currently the chief security officer at Robinhood. Um, prior to that, I was at Databricks. I helped build the team there at Databricks. Um, and then prior to that, Capital One, and actually most of my career was more on the entrepreneurial side. So I've actually been in this hiring operations side of the game for not that long, um, although it's been very, very entertaining. My name is Jessica Ferguson. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at DocuSign. I've been at DocuSign for about two years and three months now, started as uh, the deputy CISO and then took over um, the CISO role in March. Um, I've been in cybersecurity for way too long, uh, mostly in uh, a lot of tech companies, so uh, ServiceNow, F5 Networks, Alaska Airlines. So, done a lot of hiring. Great stuff. Well, thank you for the introductions. Um, as this is a community event, I spent the last couple of weeks putting on LinkedIn and Twitter, um, trying to get people from the community to ask some questions. I mean, this is an incredible panel that we're very fortunate to have in front of us today. So, um, and I've had so many kind of questions thrown my way, which will kind of start. Um, it's really nice to see that the two keynote speakers, which by the way, were incredible, both Asla, who may be in the room, and Jackie yesterday, a golden thread of their talks was bridging the cybersecurity talent gap and building culture of cybersecurity and building a great culture within these companies. So I think we'll find um, some interesting conversations today coming from here. So for the first question that I did have come through, and, and Fermin, we'll start with you if you want to answer this one. One of the questions that came through, what are the key factors and considerations that you have when you're looking to build a, a security team from, from scratch? That's a great question. Um, I mean, the, the first thing that I... I look, I mean, let, let me tell you what I did when I arrived at uh, Databricks. And, and this is a story that some of you, um, I, I'm, I'm looking at Travis, that he knows his story. The, the first thing is that you do an assessment. What, what, is, what, is the, the, what are the needs from the company? What is the, the current tools, you know, um, budget, engineers that you have? And, and I usually do four things. The first one is, what is your strategy in, in the security field? It's like, how are you going to outpace the attackers, right? Uh, the second thing that you do is like, what is your security 
organization that is going to you know, help uh, fulfill the strategy. The third thing is like, okay, what are the leaders and the, that they are going to help you to build that, uh, that organization? And finally, you know, you're building that organization from an IC level and execution, right? So um, essentially is going back to the, 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 the company that you are in, what are the needs? What are the tools and, and bridge the gap between these two things, right? And the, the first thing that you need to do is like, do I have the tools that I, that I need? And if not, you know, I, I always say this thing, it's like uh, during my first six months at Databricks, I was not a CISO, I was a recruiter. <laughs> Essentially, right? It's like a, a sourcing, you know, convincing people, building culture for uh, the, the existing people, the existing good people to, to, to persist in the company through the changes that, that we're going. You know, it's super, super important to, to bridge the gap between where you want to go, where you are. Always be recruiting. Always be recruiting. Always be recruiting. You want to go come back? Yeah. yeah. I think that's been a golden, a golden thread in our professional mm. relationship is you never, you're never offline, Caleb, with, with hiring. Same question to you. When you come into organizations, I know you've worked on startups and now large enterprise customers like Robinhood, how do you approach that? How do you approach it starting from security hiring from scratch? So, you know, this is a very complex question. Um, and I think really there's a lot of context that has to be taken into account. I think going off of what firm said, like, what stage of company are you? What type of business are you in? What's your threat model? What, where is the existing team? Where are the gaps in those teams? What do the leadership look like? There's so much context in terms of, I think, who you choose to hire. So what I'm gonna do a little bit of is I'm gonna kind of skip over some of the strategy of who you choose, because I think it can be very, very context uh, driven, is maybe talk a little bit about maybe how I hire, because I think that can be just generic across the board. Um, and so when I think about how I hire, you know, I, I do agree with, from especially when you walk in and you're building a team, you are dedicated to recruiting. Well, you have to understand, I think, you have to take this context that people are number one, talent is number one, and you cannot do anything without hiring that talent. And so you have to have that in your mindset, you have to have, you have to inflict that into your team and to the people around you, that people is number one, and how do I hire? So that you start really focusing on what is the hiring process, what's the recruiting process, how do I choose what things to deal with and let burn versus focusing on the people and the interviewing. Um, that's a really, really tough part. So I think when I first came in, that was one of the big things is instill a culture of interviewing people and candidates being number one. What's the process? How do I make that as efficient as possible? And make sure that we do the right thing and focus on hiring and how to hire. Um, and I think that in doing that, you have to make this decision because I think what the hardest part is, hey, I've got 50 fires that I've got to go deal yeah. with um, or I go focus on hiring. And at the end of the day, hiring is kind of treated as this, you know, you know, manage the corral of herd of sheep coming in and people and it's just a process, right? Like it's a process. When that's, you have to look at this and say like these fires if I don't get the right people and look at this not just being a process and about herding cattle, this is an important critical piece of what we do. You get these people, the faster you get good quality talent in, the faster these fires go away. So you have to say these fires are gonna burn for now and I'm gonna go focus on this stuff around making sure that the hiring process is just not considered a process. It's something you invest in, it's something you care about, it's something that is the core part, and how do I instill that into the teams and the culture of the company I think is important. Yeah, yeah. great answer, thank you. Um, Jessica, to kind of dovetail into another question that's come up is building these teams yeah. and moving quickly and as Caleb says, kind of choosing to kind of let fires burn, right. to sacrifice making these investments in hires that can then eventually put out the fires. Um, in such a competitive market right now that we see ourselves in, how can you, how do you get the edge over other, com other companies that are hiring for the same skill set um, and able to build a team of top security talent? Yeah, I think that there's, um, there's a couple different things that, that we have to look at. And you know, on the, on the tactical side, I think, you know, kind of echo with what uh, Caleb Furman said, you know, when you look at your strategy, 
that kind of sets the direction, the North Star of where you want to go from a hiring perspective. But I think the, you know, the first thing that I always look at is having very close relationships with my HR business partner folks because they are going to help me with looking at things like pay bands and how is comp benchmarked because uh, in a lot of cases comp is benchmarked against IT positions and we all know that security <laughs> positions cost more than IT positions and so so you can go and get all these great candidates but then you're running into roadblocks trying to get them all on boarded um, so you know I definitely think starting with looking at kind of the fundamentals of what you have what are the factors and metrics that you use to determine headcount ratios for me appsec ratio appsec engineer ratio to developer right there's that's a metric. Um, trust, we deal with a lot of business customers that, you know, we have a whole team called Trust Services that handles you know, all of our customer requests and we need to benchmark how many salespeople and how many customers and to, you know, right size and help understand how many people we need to support the, to support the mission. I think that um, in the overall, um, you know, hiring good, uh, good talent, um, you know, most of the people, I, I feel like the really great talent that I have, have either been, um, you know, uh, connections um, from the past, or having my uh, my folks tap into their to, into their connections. Yeah. We found a lot of some of my best hires have been very kind of just random, and then they happen, and it's like two weeks later you're getting this person an offer, and they've been at. Boeing for 25 years and they haven't really thought about leaving until you talked with them, right? And so I would say there's a, a, definitely a lot of kind of uh, having to sort of mine through the uh, the large, um, you know, the very large looking uh, or maybe the scary dearth of, of candidates and then, you know, being able to find out find those kind of those diamond of the rough folks that you can kind of pull up. We also do a lot of uh, internal you know recruiting right so some of my best appsec people are former qa folks some of my best you know uh you know folks in my security engineering team came from you know and services support and you know so looking for the looking at those folks and in those you know places who you know maybe kind of uh you know have kind of a security mindset that you can pull into uh into um security roles yeah. you know and i think I think the one thing that sets security folks apart is, and, and the one thing you have to look for, whether you're recruiting outside or, or, or internally, is, you know, I always kind of say, I can teach anybody security, but I cannot teach you an innate level of curiosity that says, what's next, what's next, what's next, right? And it's kind of that constant question asking that security professionals do all the time, right? Yep. Um, you know, I can, I can take anybody who has that and I can teach them security. That's not the hard part. The hard part, the harder part in a lot of cases that I find is, is really finding the folks who have that kind of innate sense of curiosity, that innate sense of kind of, okay, you've given me an answer, but I want to know the answer behind the answer and then the answer behind the answer, right? It's, which is what, you know, from a security perspective, we do all the time, whether it's threat modeling or third party risk assessment or, or whatever. But I think there's, you know, uh, there, there's a, definitely a couple different a lot of different factors and areas to look at when it comes to, to pulling talent into your team. Thank you, Jessica. I, I think another question that has come in that we'll answer in a, in a moment is the transition. Like people are, that are not in security, mm -hmm. like uh, kind of a, what is the pathway to move into that? So we will address okay. that. I guess throw it to, to both of you. Kind of, I've seen you both scale large teams in the last 12, 18 months. What's your secret sauce? What's kind of, how have you been in this kind of competitive market well, recently? Of course, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, Take notes. No, <laughs> please don't, right? I'm pleased to interview with us and then you will know, right? So, no, my, my point is, um, going back to the challenges, let, let's assume that all these, you know, combans and all these uh, processes, they are, they are good, which, uh, the, the norm is that there is work to be done. Then what, what is hiring, right? It's like, there is a lot of uh, work that, uh, goes back to us, right? It's like, uh, you may have an amazing talent acquisition team, but you know, um, in my experience, over the last probably three, four years, around 60, 70% of the sourcing is internal sourcing, right? And it's done by us, right? It's references that we know people from the past or friends of friends or campaigns that we do internally, right? So hiring, the challenge is, is to, to differentiate yourself 
from Caleb, from Jessica, from others, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, they are, um, I mean, they are uh, CSOs and CISOs from amazing companies, and you need to make sure that the candidate understands why we are better than others, or wh why we are uh, different than others, let's say this way, right? And, and one thing that I do is like, I, uh, at the end of the process, whenever we do an offer, um, and this is, well, I, I'll disclose a, a secret. I, I do something that I call a champion call, right? And, and I talk to the candidates and I explain them, hey, now you have an offer. And you also have an offer from Google. You have an offer from Robinhood. You have an offer from all these places. And I told them, amazing companies, right? But let me tell you why Databricks is better, for my opinion. Let me tell you why um, the culture that we're trying to build here, the challenge of the company, right? Uh, uh, where we're going and all these things. Let me give you enough information for you to make an informed decision, right? Those champion calls, they are amazing, right? I, uh, I'll, I'll, give a, I'll give all my secrets out, okay. so. I <laughs> uh, need a notebook here. It's, it's, so you know, here's the thing is, I actually find, I do it a little bit the opposite. Um, you know, what I tend to find is like, the, by and large, most interviews are the company vetting the candidate. It's basically like, hey, prove to us that you're good enough to work here and then we'll sell you, right? So I just reversed it. So I just said, okay, it doesn't matter who you are, what we're gonna do is I call this the reverse interview. Um, and many of you who work maybe at Robinhood have probably been, the, been through this with me, is the first call, and this is what I mean by dedication and time, so you understand the level at least when building the team that you have to commit. In the first calls, I will sit for 30 minutes and I'll basically say, you can ask me the questions. You can interview me. If I can sell you on me, the company, the culture, the people, at the beginning, because it's to me, it's like, let me prove to you why we're good enough for you to come work for us, then they get hooked. And when they're hooked, they're more excited to go through the process. And so then it's not at the end where you do the battle, you just do it right at the beginning. And by the way, I've had candidates at the beginning, we'll go through that at the beginning, the candidate will say, hey, I don't think this is probably the right fit. Mm -hmm. And I'll be like, that's awesome. And we figured it out right, right there at the beginning. And I found like that to be one of the most amazing things is when people go through that process, you know, the, the culture of us is basically saying, how can we tell you that Robinhood is a great company to work at? How can I tell you that I'm a good leader or person to work with? Um, and as soon as that is good, I think that opens up the floodgates of the candidate going through and asking the questions. Um, and that's helped a lot. And by the way, I, you know, at the beginning when you're building a team, I don't care if you're a junior, I don't care if you're an intern, I don't care if you're a senior, I will do those calls with you. Obviously, as the, comp as the team scales, as the company scales, it becomes a lot, lot harder for me to do those things. But I always offer in, across the board, one, you gotta, tell your managers and your leaders, can you convey that same culture to them? And two, I also offer, hey, if you have candidates that you consider sort of P0, like, you know, they're coming in, this is a, the, you, you definitely, like, I'll go and do it. Like, I'll come in and say right at the beginning in the first call, reverse interview, what can I answer for you? And so that's a, it's a big secret. Um, so for those of you, <laughs> Uh, it's a big secret. People uh, at the back really no. taking, <laughs> taking notes, really working hard over there. Uh, but it's, I think it's helped a lot, and it helps establish a lot of uh, trust, I think, with the candidate. Yep. Um, one, one thing I want to mention is like, um, we're talking about the edges of the process. Yeah. It is key, the, the, the interview, I mean, even in the middle, right? Uh, um, the candidate through, the, through the, um, the panels, through talking to people, either interviewing one way or the other ways, because remember, uh, whenever you interview for a company, it's two ways to interview, right? It's to give them a, a, an amazing experience. That's, that's, uh, they are literally going to have four or five hours uh, with, uh, with, the, with the company. Uh, they, you need to sell them, and they need to, not only to sell them, it's, uh, sell them the reality of how it's going to be them to be working over there, right? It's not only on the edges, it's through the interview, everyone, through the panel, the, the interview, uh, the interviewers, uh, you know, to, to, to be able to explain how it's going to be, why uh, working for this company is, is, is a good thing, what are the challenges, what is the company, where is the company going, right? And these touches of Caleb doing it at the beginning or myself doing it at the end is what, what's, what helped, but it's through the interview process. 
I can tell you from first-hand experiences that actually from the recruitment process, having that kind of level of involvement and investment and communication is, is such a golden thread of, of how you've been successful in hiring. It, it adds so much difference and is a big differentiating factor against a lot of other companies out there, for sure. And one other thing I just want to put like a, a double plus one on is the firm is thinking about transparency, right? When you go through the interview process, um, I think it's so key. You know, I've heard from others where um, people will, candidates will go through an interview process and the, and, the, and the company will just sell how great they are, what awesome things that they do. Um, and then when you walk in the door, you're surprised at the, 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 the disaster that you've kind of walked into. Uh, which by the way, you all know this, every company is a disaster behind the scenes. So like, <laughs> we all know this. Um, and so, but I think being upfront about it is really, really key. And what he was pointing is like, talk about the challenges, talk about the, the disaster that it is, because that's the thing I think candidates really like, because that shows, hey, those are things I can have impact on, right? Like I've done, you know, SDLC before, and if you're telling me your SDLC is super immature and really early, you need a lot of help, like, wow, that means I can come in and really add the value that I've learned in my past. And so I found, you know, Again, that transparency thing is really key. Uh, yeah. you, you know, if you, if you don't do it, in six months, that person is going to be gone and you're back into yeah. you know, the first stage. So you, you, lost, you essentially waste time for the candidate and yourself. Sorry. I, I was gonna say, that's a great point, right? I mean, I think most folks, you know, when they're looking at you know, uh, leaving a company, they're looking for a challenge, right? Most people want a challenge. They want a vision of where, where is, where is this company going? Where is this organization going? You know, uh, what, what am I getting myself into? And I think that, um, you know, being able to kind of sell the, here's the challenge and here's where you have opportunity to make impact. Because most, sell the disaster. Sell the disaster, <laughs> right? I mean, most people want to be able to come in and have an impact, right? Like I think it's just a fundamental human, part of human nature is you want to be able to make a change. So make a difference. Nice, you talk about kind of um, trust and transparency. I think we're talking about kind of hiring and how we get people through the door. I think a nice little segue is around kind of retention right now. I think there's a lot of companies that kind of the, the term great resignation gets overused, but has been a thing. I've seen a lot of people move and, and kind of a lot of churn from a lot of companies. So what, what do you do to build trust, collaboration, transparency, in a, in a remote workforce, like it's, this is such an amazing time to have so many people in a room right now, but it's rare, it's, it's, it's rare that we have this kind of face time. So how do you get, how do you build trust and collaboration in a re remote workforce? Um, the first thing I do is I block code red from the email system, <laughs> so they cannot talk to all my people. But, uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, at the end of the day, I mean, same as you are attracting candidates to increase your security team, the size of the security team, you need to make sure that you spend equal or more time building, you know, the, the, the qualities of, a, of an amazing team, right? Uh, that uh, we operate as a team or psychological safety or, or we, we, we got each other's back and things like that. You need to build a culture where people say, you know what, you know, I could go shop around, interview and things like that. but. Why should I? I'm happy here. I, I'm challenged. I'm doing the, the amazing things that, I, I, uh, that I'm doing right now, that they, they are uh, up to my expectations. Why should I risk this, right? So it's super, super important to build that, uh, to spend that time to build those qualities inside the team. Yeah. And of course, block it. <laughs> uh, we'll talk after. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's, there's a couple um, thoughts. Um, so, I think that the pandemic did some great things, which is it allowed everybody to work remote, which means now we started hiring remotely. And a company like DocuSign, where we used to hire everybody in San Francisco and Seattle, now I've got a third of my team is probably remote all over the United States, right? Which is, you know, fantastic because we changed a lot of culture around how the company thought about things. Um, the, you know, the downside is, is now, you know, how do you operate in that? in that world. Um, you know, I would say that the, the biggest thing that I learned is over communicate. If you think you're communicating enough with people, you're not communicating enough with people. I'm going to tell you right now because now all you have all these remote folks and they all feel remote and alone, right? And so it, it's really hard for them to feel 
connected to your building. I'll be, I'll be really honest. I started at DocuSign April of 2020, post everything shutting down. I didn't come into an office until I think April of this year. And you know, when you go in, you're like, oh, hey, there's walls in a building and I feel physically, tan I feel tangibly connected to this thing and these people, right? And that's, that's really hard when you have somebody who is remote and it's really easy for them to feel like they're just doing the job and disconnected from the broader group. So I would say, you know, over communicate, you know, that if that means, that's where I spend, I would say so much of my time. Uh, monthly AMAs, one-on-ones with everybody. I have 110 people on my team. I still try to do one-on-ones with everybody at least, you know, w once a quarter. It's it's tough, but we we get through it. Usually, you do well to be here today, then, right? <laughs> <laughs> with 100 people, right? Not with 100. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I well, yeah. Um, you know, forums. Like we've we've had to like get creative around how do we get these different groups inside of you know the org to to communicate together, right? And that's been another thing is like. Again, there's all those those uh, stop by the desk conversations that don't happen in a remote workforce, and so yeah. people feel like they struggle with understanding what's happening, you know, what's happening across the organization, who's doing what, you know, kind of that natural conversation kind of things that would normally happen don't get to happen. So you really have to be very intentional about how you make that happen. And you know, I think as you know, the leader of the organization, our respective organizations, it's up to us to make that happen, right? Because otherwise, it's it, you know, it will happen organically at, a, at a, maybe a group level, but at an org level, it, it, it'll struggle. So. Yeah, I, I really don't have a good answer for this. That's why I'm, la I'm learning <laughs> these two. I'm going to let these two uh, so I can learn. Uh, I would just say this. I think that what I've noticed, if I were to think about an overall challenge with remote work is it seems to me that uh, remote work there's there's like is really lends itself well for in-depth tunnel focused sort of vision and working hard through deep problems right like real work as long as you're not on slack um, and then the uh, but what really suffers is decision making fast decision making mm -hmm. I think suffers um, and so it's difficult to figure out well how do you really make up the fast decision making problem working remotely? And I'll be very blunt, I don't know of a great answer to that. Um, I think there's lots of different thoughts from, you know, daily stand ups to, you know, having a strategy meeting, everyone comes in the office once a day or once a week, you know, what are these, whatever these things are, but um, I don't know. I, I would love if people have good thoughts on that, that would be great to hear. I think Elon Musk uh, has recently <laughs> made a decision <laughs> on how that works. Maybe yeah. don't take advice from that one. It's a good opportunity. Uh, <laughs> um, What's that? It's a good opportunity. I mean, uh, oh, it's, for hiring, it's a great yeah. opportunity. No, yeah. sure, no, I mean, think about this. I'm pretty sure some some people are going to be happy because they want to go to the office. Yeah. Some people they don't want. They, they they feel like okay, maybe one or two days. Some people is like. No, I don't want to go to the office, right? So, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, he's, he's made the call. He's well, one thing to respect is he made the call. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right? He's like, you, if, you, yeah. if you don't like it, go. If you do, you're in. And yeah. I mean, it's it, you got to respect his stance. He made the call. And he's owning it. Like, he, yeah. he, is, yeah. he is present and he is there in the factories every day. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, the last couple of, well, yesterday I had a lot of people come to, to our booth and we talked about this panel today and not to inflate all of your egos, uh, but you are very seasoned leaders. Um, a lot, common question that's come through is... We fake it well. <laughs> yeah. But you're at you're, you're prestigious companies, then you've done great work with hiring talent. But a, a common question that's come through, that, and I, knowing that I had this panel today, was I'm a new security hiring manager or I'm a startup owner or I'm just been pushed into a, a kind of a leadership opportunity and want to scale a team. I know that this is thinking back many moons from when you were kind of just building a team out. What advice would you give to somebody that is starting kind of their management career and needs to hire? Okay, why am I always the first one? I think we should. We're, we're trying to steal we your idea. We're trying to steal your ideas, Furman. Let's reverse it, right? <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll I'll take a first stab at it. Um, so I would say for for someone who is uh, uh, moving into management or building a group, hiring a team, whatever that is. Um, 
Uh, congratulations and welcome to the hardest job you will ever do. I'm just going to say this. Like, I, I think that, you know, we talk about resignations and people leaving and, you know, it hurts, right? Like, I hear people give resignations and I'm just like, ugh. Gosh, right? Like another one, right? And so, you know, you 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 feel that you kind of feel very connected to your people, hopefully, and hopefully, you know, you you build that investment. So when people do leave, it's it's tough. Um, I would say that, um, you know, the from a uh, the first thing that you'll want to understand, kind of moving into a new into a new manager role, is it really is about building that investment and that mind share with um, with your team and with the members of the team that you're bringing on board um, I think that you know there's there's a saying that you know and I don't know how true it is today but there's a saying that you know people you know uh, what's the saying something about people don't leave great managers they leave they leave bad companies um, mm. and I think that you know there's uh, there there is a big piece and and it gets understated where you know a great manager can hold a team together, right? Even through a lot of uh, adversity as a company. And I think that, um, you know, building that mindshare and building that relationship with your folks and is going to be, you know, job number one. And I've, I'll be honest, um, I've learned from so many people who have been uh, peers of mine on, you know, how to uh, build team cohesion, how to, uh, lift your team up, um, you know, and really kind of make, uh, you know, the folks um, on your team sort of the front and, you know, I support them from behind. I think the other thing is, you know, make sure that you are being uh, intentional about building diverse teams. And I know, you know, we, we talk about it all the time, but, you know, it we still haven't done enough and I'm going to be, raise a hand, DocuSign hasn't done enough to build diverse teams, um, you know. Who are your who are, who are in your who's in your interview panels? Is it all white guys? Because Absolutely. if a black woman walks in the room, there's gonna be, it's gonna be really tough. If any kind of underrepresented minority walks in the room, it's gonna be tough. It's gonna be very intimidating, right? Going or it's gonna give a real insight into the culture of the company, right? It's all very monochrome. Um, you know, I think that you know uh, hiring uh, diverse candidates. You know, building diverse teams, bringing in different um, points of view. You know, be flexible with who you hire. Like I, like I said before, like there are people that you will identify in other groups in your company, and you will say, and I've, I've done this before, and it's actually one of the biggest things that's brought me joy. Is I will take you know somebody who is in desktop support, and they're they're like, hey, I'm interested in the cybersecurity thing. Like, what should I do? And I'm like, yeah, come on. Come over here, right? And and building them up, and now they're architects at eBay and stuff like that, right? And nice. and you kind of get to see them, you know, kind of grow up and move. And I think that, um, you know, finding that that diamond in the rough talent, and 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 being like, yes, you, I want you on my team, right? And and making that sense of inclusion, you know, they don't need to be, you know, the whiz bang hacker, right? Um, some of the best folks on my team were, you know in the video editing business, right? Like they had nothing to do with, with cybersecurity or even with technology in general, but you know, now they're like kind of some of the leads of some of our biggest projects. So I think that um, it really is key to look outside of kind of just the normal box of where you would look to hire from. So I'm sorry, long answer. Great that answer. was that yeah. a great, great answer. Um, in fact, there's not much I think I can follow on to that because I think these are all phenomenal points around just learning how to be a manager and a leader and what are some great so i'm going to be a little bit more tactical on mine and i'll be very security focused since i think you really covered a lot um i'll say when i think when you're thinking about building your team um you know first it, if you're a first time leader and manager building a team this probably means you're working at a small company would be my guess yep. and you're starting from scratch so i would recommend two things in when you're looking for your first team to hire, which is going to be really important. Whoever those first people are that you hire are going to help set your culture of your team. First, I would probably focus on good general athletes. The, and second, they need to have the attitude to sort of the point made earlier around curiosity. 
um, hard work, good general athletes. When you're small and you're starting a team, it's not like, oh, I need someone really good at DNR, oh, I need someone really good at pen test, oh, I need someone really good at AppSec. You need people who have some good diverse experience and just want to dive into, they just, they're curious, they just want to learn and they want to dive. So when you think about hiring those, the first sort of three or four people around you, really look at some good general athletes and how they're going to help you. Um, and also you always need one person that's going to, that's going to help tie all the tech people, <laughs> policy programs, compliance, you need one of those in your teams to help tie everything together too. Um, I would say those would be the, the tactical things I might say when, you, when you're a first time manager. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know what I can say after this. Uh, <laughs> that's, why, things, that's why you want to go that, first. That's that's just, yeah. Yeah. Next time I want you, to be you first. Are, you're go I want first. to be first. You offered yeah. it up. Okay, no, I, I will try, right? So you're, you're, you're a new manager, right? So on top of all the new things that you need to do, you need to build feature X or you need to mitigate whatever it is, right? So there's a lot of pressure, right? And then you, you, you need to build a team and you need, maybe you have two, three people, four people, you need to retain those people, right? On top of that, you need to, you know, increase the team size to deliver, you know, the final thing that you were hired for, right? So there's a lot of pressure, right? So the, the, the best advice that uh, uh, I can give you to a new uh, manager is like, don't be a hero. You are not alone, right? Yeah. So start talking to others, start leveraging, uh, you know, the, the knowledge and expertise from other people. Get a mentor, uh, talk to, uh, and there's there is actually, uh, maybe not in, even in your company, there's uh, people in the industry that uh, they do the, hey, I'm the CISO for, well, I'm going to quote uh, someone that I know, Nico Weisman, the CISO for Lyft. He does. Uh, sessions uh, with uh, you know uh, folks from the industry that they want to be a new CISO or they want to do these things, right? So kudos to Nico, by the way. Um, what, what I'm trying to say is like you have your job to to do. You have a job to retain the people, the good people that you have. So you need to invest in you know uh, the good qualities that I was talking about, and then you, you need to hire, right? And don't be a hero. There is multiple things, and you will make mistakes. It's totally expected. I mean, yeah. I made ton of mistakes. I, I I'm probably I should not mention them because this is being recorded. But uh, you know, it's okay to make mistakes because by making mistakes, you learn for the next one. You're going to do better. You're going to retain your, your team better. You're going to hire people better, right? And other things that, uh, that uh, Jessica and uh, Caleb mentioned is like, you know, the, the, I mean, hiring only security professionals with security experience, that's one way. Hiring people, new grads, um, Building them as a security professional, that's another one. You know, uh, going to other fields, you know, a developer that is an amazing developer and, uh, and, and uh, helping them grow into a security professional, that's another one, right? It's, it's, there is no silver bullet. It's like put your, uh, put your bets in different things, right? And, 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 and that way you will be able to, you know, accomplish with mistakes, you know, hiring, retaining, and doing your job, right? But don't be a hero. I, I, I man, I. I don't know that you're, you're worried about going last, but that don't be a hero and use other <laughs> was amazing. Iconic, yeah. That was amazing. Uh, That'll be the only quote of this uh, whole CISO panel, won't it? Yeah. Don't be a hero. <laughs> uh, I, I also, because I just want to just re-emphasize this, like when you're small, you're, you're, you're so right, Fermi, mean, like working with engineering and the rest of the company and getting their help is part of the job as a CISO mm -hmm. too, right? And getting that culture and getting them to help and uh, doing that, that's like, it's super critical, yeah. Nice, thank you folks. Um, I had a question come through from uh, Twitter uh, the last couple of days, and it's kind of related to recruiting, but it's, um, and maybe we'll start with you, Furman. Okay. <laughs> well, well, I mean, okay, go for I it. I never get to start, yeah. I'm in the middle, I'm in the middle. I, 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 never, I never get either one. Caleb, be my guest, no, no, no. be my guest. <laughs> You guys battle between yourselves. Uh, with all the economic uncertainty we're seeing right now, especially in the tech space, um, companies making layoffs um, and cuts generally, how do you plan to make security a priority at your company? I mean, it depends on the context of the company, right? So um, in, in the context of Databricks, right, because of the product that we sell, Right? To, to some degree, we, we deal with other secret sauce, right? So security is a priority for the company, right? At the end of the day, under any financial situation, right, you, you are going to take a look to what are my priorities? Uh, you know, marketing or uh, sales or engineering. Um, but for us, security is, is a key pillar because without security, um, there, there is no GTM uh, focus here, right? So obviously, I mean, there, there, 
I mean, we, we will see this, and we, I don't have a crystal ball to see if we're going to go into a recession or not, and things like that. Companies are adjusting, right? For me, it's not a challenge, it's an opportunity, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, if companies are adjusting, it's like, hey, uh, le let me take a look why, uh, I mean, le let me go into LinkedIn and, and search for all those Tesla security engineers <laughs> that may not want to go back to the office, right? Because they, they could be good people over there, right? Yeah, I agree. So again, uh, 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 Take advantage of your strengths, exploit, exploit the weaknesses of others. I'm, I'm gonna be a little spicy on this one. Um, my thoughts are, are don't try to make security the top priority in the company. Um, I don't think, oh, well, I got one fan on that spicy <laughs> comment. I got, your, I got isn't one. That, isn't that your boss over there? <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I would say, you know, when you think about, like, the, it doesn't matter what business you're in, security is never going to be the top priority. Even if you're a security vendor, uh, it's not the top priority. Um, what I would focus on instead is there are spots or areas in your company that you can make security in the top three, right? Or at least in the top five. Um, and so the way like I think about it, I'll be very sort of generic is like, you ever heard of sort of like the Intel architecture ring zero, ring one, like there's like in ring zero, these are your top critical, super paranoia, ring one a little bit less, ring two, ring three, you know, you get, there are across an organization, there are going to be different levels of where security really needs to be priority versus where it doesn't, uh, or where you can be a little more lax. And I think you need to find the areas that are the most critical for you to have either ring zero or ring one, focus on those areas and help the team do it. And ultimately, if you really do the job really well, security does become a little bit more built in and becomes more invisible to the business and what it does. Um, but I think those are the key areas I would focus on. Hey, this team in this specific area, what they're doing is super sensitive and super uh, super, like, we got to focus on that, help go to them and figure out how to embed security into their processes and make that a priority with that team, and you can make a lot of progress that way. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, from a, from a, from a DocuSign perspective, you know, we, uh, we consider ourselves um, a trust brand. We use that terminology all the time. It's all over the place, right? Um, we hold everybody's data, right? We hold everybody's mortgage documents and loan signings, and I'm sure everybody has DocuSigned something once. It'd be an interesting study on who hasn't. But anyway, um, you know, but all that data, you know, lives in our cloud, right? And so, um, you know, from our perspective, uh, you know, we're going to continue to build and grow our team. That's that's not really a concern from my perspective. You know, I think that. Um, you know, and we'll take advantage of anybody who's laying off and we'll <laughs> pull all those people over because it's good talent here, so. I think it's a huge opportunity. Yeah. yeah, I agree entirely. I think that you can spin out his head and say, we're able to reach out to talent and attract talent that we weren't able to Absolutely. do so 12, 18 yeah. months ago. Yeah, but Tom, I mean, uh, that's, if, if you have the, if you have the opportunity to keep growing, right? Because there is companies that they will not because, you know, security, you know, as uh, I agree with Caleb, right? It's like, may not be their priori one of the, their pro top priorities, right? So then what do you do? You focus on retaining your people, right? You, you go in, instead of going out, out there, is that you, you try to protect your, your, your crown jewels, essentially. Or, or, or if you think about it, if security is not your top priority, right? Which, listen, at the end of the day, every business, like, will always say, hey, security is important but it's never the top. Well, why? Well, because the top business, the top priority is being a business, mm -hmm. right? We all know this, like we have to be a business, otherwise we, security doesn't matter because we won't exist. We need to make money. And that is really ultimately the most secure, to be blunt. Um, but here's the thing, is like if we know this, then our job is not to go and fight for the top spot. And also I feel like as our job as an expectation as being in this industry is we're not gonna be the top priority. So how do we make changes and impact in order knowing that and knowing it in a way that enables the teams, sets the right context around what they're doing, allows them to say, hey, it's not just, hey, do this to be secure, but hey, if you do this, it's an easier route of what you're doing today and it also happens to be secure, right? This is a much better model and allows you to align with the business, allows you to make more, more progress with, mm -hmm. the, with engineer and the rest of the, 
the cross-functional partners, and you're not like, I sh we should set that expectation. Like, hey, as although it's great when the CEO stands up and says, hey, security is important, privacy is important, right? Like for example, at Robinhood, we have a safety first, right? It's right in our principles. It's great when you hear that happen, but like, let's set the expectations. Hey, at the end of the day, it's awesome to hear it, but when it comes to execution, let's not expect it and let's not rely on it, right? We can't rely on someone at the top saying it's important for us to adopt what we're doing. We've got to assume that they're not and that we're not the top priority. So then how does that change our thinking? Yeah, it's, um, I'm sorry to, to hijack this a little bit, yeah. but it's, uh, it's a question of being more efficient, right? At the end of the day, I'm pretty sure that all of you have a long laundry list of things that they are wrong in, in, in your own companies, right? Um, and if you go one by one, it probably will take 10 years to do all of them, right? So what, what are the top three, top four, top five that uh, if you have resources, not infinite ones, or maybe less than what you have right now because there may be a recession or whatever, right? What are those ones that they are going to be giving you the most bang for the back, right? So completely agree with you, Caleb. Great stuff. Well, I think we've got time for one last question. Something that you actually kind of indirectly addressed earlier, but it's a dying question I've had about from three, four different people. What skill sets do you think can be learned on the job for security folks? And I guess what skill sets can't? Um, you know, I, I, I think I'm going to repeat myself a little bit, but, you know, there is, if I look at what makes, you know, some of the best security folks on my team, it's not the background that they have. It's not the, you know, experience that they have, although that helps, right? But I think fundamentally it is, right, and in, in whether it's incident response, threat models, engineering, I'm sitting down with the development team talking about a new feature. It's always asking the, okay, that's great, and what else, and what else, and what else, right? It's that curiosity of getting to and sort of extracting and pulling apart everything and figuring, you know, and, and being able to understand the inputs and the outputs and, and the, of, of a thing, right? And, and how it works and what are all the things that a development team is not telling you about that are the really, really interesting parts when you start asking questions and it's like, you know. Uh, and, and so, again, I think that is that kind of, that curiosity, that, in, in, that innate, um, you know, uh, sort of follow-up is, is the thing that you can't teach. You know, I, I can bring folks in from community colleges and put them into a SOC and teach them to be a SOC analyst and then move them into IR. I can put developers who do QA, right, work into AppSec teams. I can pull, you know, folks who have done, you know, desktop support and put them in engineering teams, right? So, you know, there's a lot of transferable skills, right? Pretty much anything that any group in a development slash IT, even legal and, you know, um, uh, finance organization was done has some translation capability, you know, uh, into uh, into a security function, whether it's you know, audit, risk, you know, appsec, secops, right? Yeah. Any any of those functions. So, you know, I think that uh, it's it's really more about. So, I would say, if you're thinking about going into security and you're hung up on the well, I don't know enough to go into security. I'm going to tell you right now, you probably, there's an opportunity for you there somewhere. somewhere. I'm, I'm just saying, <laughs> like, there is a security manager that's looking to hire you, I promise. Um, so, you know, I, I, would, I would definitely not be hung up on the, well, I don't know, uh, so I can't do this, right? And, and, and really look at the, what do you know and what is the skill set that you do bring? And then, you know, a, a good manager, can probably map most skill sets into into what they need and form that person, mold that person. I can go. I can go next. So I'm, I'm going to defer a little bit into this one. Although I agree, but I, I think there are other type of skills that uh, you can learn on the job, right? Um, I mean, apart from the technical skills, I mean, if you're on IR, you you, you, let, you will learn how to do forensics, how to manage an investigation. But at the end of the day, security teams usually. Um, we, we, we interact with others, so others do the, the, the changes to mitigate risk and things like that, right? So the, the things that I uh, think they are super, super important are the soft skills. Mm -hmm. how, uh, how you talk to others. Yeah. How you write an email, 
I mean, literally, uh, the, the way that you could write an email, you could, you could win someone or you could lose them forever, right? And, and then if, uh, the, the way that you build a bridge, the way, the way that you, it's totally different. For example, whenever you send an email to someone asking for, hey, sorry, I'm going to run your Friday, but can you do this? If you have had a coffee or a beer with that person before, it's way, way easier, okay. right? So those soft skills, how do you build those bridges? How do you, you, you talk to uh, a new person? How do you understand their, their world? How do you uh, try to, you know, to be a partner on their world while they uh, win them over to be a partner on your world, right? So soft skills, those are the things that, and, and, and they can be used not only in security, in, in other, other fields, super, super important, right? Yeah. Technical skills, yeah, you would keep growing. But people f usually forget about the other ones, and they are probably as important as, as the technical ones. Yeah, um, I will say I, I agree with all of these. Um, I actually will just add a nice to have. Um, I don't think this is even a, a, a necess necessary. I think it's just a little bit of passion for the field. Um, you know, like we're here on a Sunday. Um, you know, some people, people who are in security, Sometimes stick in security just because they love it. It's just a great thing to be in. You love the, 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 the like, it, this is a weird thing I'm gonna say, but like when I read about the new, like if I see a new exploit that's been released that's like pretty innovative, I, it kind of is exciting. It's, I, I'm kind of impressed. I'm like, wow, kudos, like this is like a good one. Um, like, you know, it's just, it always impresses me the way attackers work and the way this field works. And it's just something that I'll always be in. And, you know, this is a nice to have. I don't believe this is a necessary, but if you can find people that really just love it for what it is, it's, it's a great thing yeah, to look for. You know, you know I'm, I'm sorry to hijack the meeting again. Uh, one, one thing that I, um, as a TLDR of what I was mentioning, to some degree to what you were mentioning, uh, Caleb, don't be a jerk. That's something that, that, that's something very valuable to learn, right? It's like, you know, if you're a jerk to someone, that will come back later, right? It's, it's, it doesn't cost you anything to be nice, right? If you say please with a smile, yeah, and, and, and then whenever they do it, say thank you, you know, you're going to win a lot of people over. Well, on that, thank you. <laughs> Sincerely. You're welcome. Caleb talked about giving time upon a Sunday. Like, it's, I feel honored to have shared this stage with Firm and Caleb and Jessica, some, both um, Firm and Jessica actually flew in today just for this talk. Caleb walked a couple of blocks, so thank you. <laughs> uh, but sincerely, can we raise uh, a round of applause for these incredible CISOs? Thank you. Thank you all so much for the discussion and presentation here at B-Side San Francisco. On behalf of the conference and uh, our speaker gift sponsor, Maltigo, uh, we have gifts of appreciation. And so just want to thank you again. Thank you. Appreciate it.